Okay. Uh. Oh God. Oh God. Oh God. Oh God. Okay. Oh, okay, you hear me. It wasn't working for a second there, so I just had to quickly change my inputs and stuff. Um, I hope uh, that the noise isn't too bad. Um, my pop filter is completely busted, so I'd, my pop filter might fall off in the middle of me doing stuff. Um... Okay, it's not like too noisy or anything. I know I'm in a okay, so I took I took my uh microphone out of the closet because it's my my iPad is not charged, so I can't look up my script and do it in the closet to try to dampen the noise. So it's just out and this is a small room. It's a very like hard edge room and um like I said, it kind of amplifies. Um, it kind of amplifies the sound of my computer, which is probably that background noise that you're hearing. But I'm glad if it's not loud or distracting, that's that's a good thing. <laughs> Sorry, I had to uh, pop away there uh, from Discord. I just wanted to kind of get things up and running. And um, Wait, wait a couple minutes and see if anybody else... I know, how dare I? Uh, see if anybody else shows up uh, and wants to listen to some stuff, which would be pretty cool. Um, the thing that says Podfic is very, very... I've never noticed this before. The quality is very bad. Oh, uh, I clicked on... I changed the... It's a little better. It's a little better. That's not too bad. Okay. I'm I can live with that. Um Yeah. How's everybody doing in the chat? I say to one person. <laughs> um Yeah. Let me just look up the fanfic that I wanted to... I should have had this all done already, but I always say, like, oh, I'll be a half an hour, and then it takes me a lot longer to get set up. I should uh, be kind of set up before I even announce it, and then I can just come on and do it. Um... I might only do... Um, I might only do these two. Yeah, so I I have two that I wanted to do. One is a Matrix fanfic that is a very, very long fanfic. It's very long. Um, it's it's called Awakenings. I think I've mentioned it before, and. The way that it tells the story is, um, it's very, I guess you could say Quentin Tarantino. It kind of drops you in the middle of something that's happening, and then it kind of jumps back and forth between the beginning and the end to eventually kind of tell you the whole story. So it can be very difficult, um, to read, uh, and very difficult to follow, um, so I, I wasn't sure, like, the, f the first, the prologue and the first chapter, you're in the middle of a bunch of stuff that you're kind of like, what the fuck is going on? Um, and uh, that's not always the funnest thing to listen to, but it's a genuinely nice fic, and so I wanted to share it, um, at least part of it, and maybe, like, the next time I do a stream, I'll do another chapter of it or something, but it's very, very, very long. Um, the other one is a Good Place fanfic, the Good Place fanfic, uh, called the Though Near or Far, which I wanted to do in the past, but there was somebody in the chat who was like, I can't deal with, like, graphic depictions of violence and stuff, which is totally fine. If, if there's people that don't want to hear that, that's okay, but this is a fic that I really want to read. Like, I've wanted to do it since I started doing, uh, live stream 
readings. Um, it's got five chapters. I would probably just, like I said, just do one chapter uh, and then just see how we felt about it. They're kind of shorter chapters, so it's not a big deal. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 uh, I don't want to say it's overly graphic. I feel like it is. Like there's some, the, some moments in it that are, um, violent and not pleasant, but at the same time, I don't feel like it goes into gross detail. It, I think it does a very tasteful job of talking about very untasteful things. So, um, or distasteful, <laughs> as some might say. So yeah, those are the two that I'm kind of thinking of, um, and just reading, like I said, the first chapter. Um, the Matrix one, Awakenings, has a prologue, which is very, very short, and then a first chapter, which is actually quite long. Um, so I wasn't sure if maybe to, you know, sort of whet our appetites for listening to things or, you know, get our ears sort of ready. I would read the, um, the good place one first and then read the matrix one second. Uh, and then I think my dad wants me to make dinner. <laughs> so, um, I might even have to stop in the middle of this to make dinner. So, um, we'll just see where we get to. Uh, but yeah, it's up to you which one you want to hear first. Uh, seeing as there seems to be one person, that's fine. It's all good. I'm not too worried about how many people are here. I mean, if it's just you and me, let's just have fun with it. Let's just roll with it. <laughs> and inevitably, inevitably, I end up getting nervous. I have no reason to be nervous. But of course I am. Okay. So I'm going to read Though Near or Far because I feel like uh, I read, I read, reread some of it last night and things like that. I just feel like more prepped for it. So let's do that. Let's start with that and uh, see how we feel and where we're at. Okay. So I'm... The reason that I like Though Near or Far, um, I have a hurt comfort thing that I love, and I love seeing characters I love get horrible things happen to them, which is not the nicest, but I have that for sure. Um, but also, I just feel like the writing in this is very character-wise spot on, and that's how I feel about, like, basically everything Chikoroskiro writes. It's very in character, and it's very... Um, you never feel like anybody is not getting their fair share of time or that you you get the sense that this person understands how these people work as a team. They understand um, what each person wants and what they do. And that's why I really enjoy it. And that's why I wanted to share it. So uh, I will start chapter one. In a way, Michael had always expected it would come down to this. He'd hoped it wouldn't, sure. Even knowing the odds, some tiny too-human part of him had dared to dream that they might all make it out, that they'd win their case, and that even a demon could somehow make it into the good place, that they would all stay together forever. But even that part of him is satisfied with the ending he got. The humans might think well of him most of the time, but he knows what he is and what he's done. He was never really going to be accepted into the good place. No, saving the humans had to be the priority, and he did that. They got out. If there's any justice to be had, they won't come back. It's so much easier not to be scared knowing that. He can even mock Sean to his face because he's the winner here, almost as much as he ever could have been. Almost. The cold marble in his palm reminds him of that. Can we just get rid of this guy already? The bad Janet perched on Sean's desk asks, tapping out a text. 
I'm sick of listening to him whine. Yes, let's get this over with. But instead of forcing him out of the room to where his retirement will take place, Sean just crosses to the front of his desk, leaning back against it as he stands over Michael. The look on his face is intent. Michael presses back into the chair, one hand closing tightly around Janet's marble like he can somehow still try to keep her safe. Every instinct is screaming at him to run or to fight. But he knows neither option would get him anywhere. There's a hundred demons outside who would gladly tear him apart if he tried to escape. And if he stood any chance fighting Sean, he would have tried it long before now. What are you doing? Isn't it obvious? Oh wait, it's probably not. The stupidity of those humans has obviously rubbed off on you. Sean sneers. There's something gathering in the air, a subtle energy Michael can feel humming through the sixth dimension. He shudders. Even Bad Janet seems affected. She's set her phone aside, down on the desk, to watch what's going on. I can't retire you. It'd be too public. But I do need to do something with you, and I've been thinking. He raises a hand. Maybe not all of your ideas were complete garbage. Wait, no! Michael lunges forward, barely registering Bad Janet doing the same, because neither of them reaches Sean before he snaps. Okay, there's a bit of a break here, so I'm just going to have a drink. Woo! Like I said, if there's anything um, off with the sound, just let me know. <clears throat> Don't like Sean. Stinky, stinky Sean. Stinky boy. Bad. <laughs> He's a... Uh... I like, I like hating Sean. <laughs> Sean is such a dipshit, and I love him for it. <laughs> um, but yeah, not my favorite character, but not because he's a bad character. But you just, you probably shouldn't like him. <laughs> Eleanor expects the demons to tear them apart from each other as soon as they go back through the portal. But instead, they're greeted on the other side by a pair of large, bored-looking guys. That took a while. One of them comments as they move to flank the group of humans. Come with us. Yeah, great. Hi to you too, Eleanor grumbles. But as she allows herself to be herded along, one of her hands is in Chidi's and the other is in Tahani's, and as long as they're moving on their own... They aren't being separated just yet. The room's busy now. A hive of demonic activity. Eleanor hadn't taken much of it in before. There's lines of desks that look like they belong in an old-timey bank, and even a coffee machine set up to one side. It's all so ridiculously mundane. The demons look nothing more than a bunch of pasty cubicle dwellers, except for the one except for the open amusement in their eyes as they turn to watch the humans being marched past. Eleanor clenches her jaw and lifts her chin, refusing to acknowledge them. She doesn't think she's ever held hands with anyone for this long, ever, in her life. She can't suppress the thought that they all probably look like a bunch of kindergartners lining up for recess but she doesn't care about any of that now. She made her choice to stay with them, no matter what. She'll hold on, as long as she can. They're directed right through to the center. They're directed right through the center of the bullpen, between all the desks and into one of the overlooking offices. Their escort shuts the door, behind them and a lock clicks into place. 
The office is lit in the same dull gray light as the rest of the building. A bad Janet sulks in the corner, twirling her bottle blonde hair around one finger. At the desk, Sean glances up from some paperwork. Oh, it's you four. Oh, it's us? Eleanor echoes disbelievingly. Behind her, Chidi is standing close, and she can hear the clunk, clunk, clunk of someone trying the doorknob. Man, you are trying way too hard to be cool about this. That party must have been pretty embarrassing for you, huh? Eleanor! Chidi hisses in a panic. She ignores him. What are they going to get? What? Are they going to get tortured even more forever? Sean just looks unmute, unmoved. That was a minor inconvenience. You four are the last loose ends, and you're about to be tied up. The last loose ends. There's been a pit in Eleanor's stomach for hours. One she was trying to ignore, and it aches at that. She glances around the office again, as if she'll find Michael, alive and well, and just hiding behind the coat rack or something. It's stupid. Janet probably escaped to her void, but she saw Michael get captured by Sean. He's not a loose end. He's just gone. Hey, Janet! Jason waves at the bad Janet, then turns to Sean. Hey, boss guy! My name's Jake Jordles, and I work in the Molotov cocktail department. What? No. I know who you are. Dude, I know who you are too! That's so rad! Oh, but can we still bull tap? Only Tahani's hand in his stops Jason from darting around the desk. Sean jerks back a little at the sudden movement, watching with a glint of wary confusion in his otherwise still stony gaze. Eleanor can't help but grin a little. Sean's never really dealt with Jason much, has he? She'd love to inflict a little more on him just to see how much that composure can crack. But Tahani's half hiding behind her, whatever confidence carried her through her argument with the judge completely spent. Chidi's breaths are coming short and shallow in her ear. He's about to have a panic attack, or he's already having one. Eleanor wouldn't mind going down hissing and spitting. If she were alone, she might even see it if she could give Sean a black eye just for a fun memory to hold on to while she's being burned alive. But she's not alone, and the others are still reeling from the failed tests. Drawing this out would just be... kind of cruel. Okay. She squeezes Chidi and Tahani's hand and takes a deep breath. If you're going to torture us, just do it already. Full offense, but being in here with you is already bad enough. You're so eager. Sean sits up straighter, scrutinizing her. That brief hint of feeling is entirely gone. God, Eleanor would feel so much better if he'd just have facial expressions like a normal person. To be honest, so am I. This is going to be fun. Bad Janet, take them to their new neighborhood. Ugh, fine. Without looking up from her phone, Bad Janet steps forward and holds out a hand to them. Eleanor leans back. All of us? We're going together. She's not sure how to feel about that. It has to be some kind of trap. Watching her friends get their limbs peeled doesn't sound like her idea of a good time, but it still might be slightly better than going through that alone? Maybe. Sean raises an eyebrow. Would you prefer being separated? No, no, that's... Silently, she curses herself for losing her cool. Now he knows that it matters to her. Whatever, man. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, wrong character, one sec. <laughs> Blah, blah, blah. Are you idiots done talking yet? Yeah? Great. Bad Janet leans forward to touch Eleanor's shoulder, and with a soft bloop, 
the world vanishes. And there's another break, so I'm just going to look at the chat. Yeah, uh, so this is an alternate universe of the good place. So when, when they all went to the judges in the original story, the original, the canon, um, when they went to the good place, uh, Michael escaped, excuse me, with, uh, with bad Janet, or with Janet's help. And, um, and he gets to the judges and then they go from there, they go to earth. In this version, um, Michael didn't escape. It was a different, there was a different punishment for him than what was in the show. And, um, in this fic, he, um, Sean, how do I put this? Okay, so in the original canon, um, the same thing happens where Sean, uh, Michael thinks that Sean has marbleized Janet, but Janet is actually hiding as a bad Janet, so she's safe. But in the show, he gets put into a room where he's going to be tortured for all, e well, he's going to be left there for all eternity. And in this, that's not what's happening. He's he's not being put in the room. There's a different punishment in mind. So I hope I, I hope that clears it up a little bit. Michael is a coat rack. It's true. <laughs> But if you have any questions throughout it, like, don't hesitate to ask. Okay. Existence pops back a second later. Or, well, it kind of doesn't. Oh, man, Jason says tugging loose of Tahani to look around at the featureless black surrounding them. This is just like that time those guys stole Michael's office! The bad Janet lets go of Eleanor, sweeping a disdainful glaze over the group. Later, losers. Bloop! Eleanor holds her position for a second, then relaxes. She's gone. Okay, guys, group up. They're not just going to leave us in a void. Something's going to happen. She waves her hand impatiently until the others form a vague back-to-back -back circle. There's nothing to look at. Darkness around them, darkness above them. She's not even sure what they're standing on. Could it be more darkness? I appreciate what you're doing, Eleanor, Chidi says, rubbing his hands anxiously on his pants, pant legs as he peers around into the void. But I really don't think this is going to help. Shh. She knows it's not going to help. It just makes her feel better, acting like they can protect themselves somehow. Just keep an eye out. We might have a few minutes. They haven't even sent this place, set this place up yet. Get ready to run or kick a demon in the... Everyone scatters away from the sound, yelping in alarm. But seeing who it is, they don't run or kick. Oh, Michael, you startled us. Tahani, Tahani gasps, pressing a hand over her chest. Why does everyone have to do that today? Chidi demands of no one. Eleanor ignores them all, striding right up to Michael. There's another bad Janet with him watching him carefully over the top of her phone. But it's probably just regular Janet, right? She must have gotten away and saved him from wherever Sean put him. And she must have done it quick, too. He's still dressed in that drab gray suit, but he doesn't seem to be hurt at all, not even mildly ruffled. This whole time she's been stressing out over what must be happening, what must be happening to him because of her. And he's just been having hijinks with Janet? She should be relieved. No, she is relieved. But what comes out of her mouth is, What the fuck, man? And what she does is punch him in the arm. 
He looks at the spot where she hit him, and then back to back at her. He isn't smiling, she realizes, or even readying an apology. He's just watching her, brow furrowed, like she's a homework problem he hasn't quite managed to crack yet. Eleanor's anger drops off suddenly, replaced by something colder. Michael hasn't given her a look like that for a long time. She starts to step back, but he catches at her hand. Hey, now, no need to run off so fast. His voice is soft. His fingers curl easy, easily around her wrist and squeeze. Let go of me. Eleanor tries to yank her arm away. Michael doesn't let go. Michael? Chidi takes a step forward. Michael's eyes dart to him for a second, and then he smiles and twists his hand in a quick, sharp motion. Something in Eleanor's wrist snaps. Even she can't suppress a scream. Everyone explodes. How dare you! Tahani shrieks, lunging towards Michael, fire apparently returned. What on earth do you think you're doing? She'd be getting up in his face, but Chidi's holding her back. He's put himself between the two, not taking his eyes off Michael, though he's still muttering frantically about how this isn't good. This really isn't good. Jason's the one brave or foolish enough to dart forward and tug Eleanor away. She lets him wrap his arm around her shoulders. Sucks in a harsh breath sucks in harsh breaths and blinks hard to clear her eyes. Amid the chaos, Michael smiles and raises both hands. Okay, I can see that you're all a little confused here. Why don't we start this over again? His tone's genial. It reminds Eleanor of the first time they met, in that office where he told her she'd arrived in the good place. This is hell. You're being tortured, starting now. Bad Janet, don't just stand there. Construct the neighborhood. Bad Janet doesn't fire any comments back. She just waves a hand. There's no fire, no screaming. The floor doesn't become spiders. Instead, cobblestones spread out from beneath their feet like ripples on a pond. Colorful houses and storefronts fold up out of the ground constructing themselves just as quickly as they dissolved. And as bright blue... And as a bright blue sky closes in above them, and the bright, cheerful facade of the fake good place is completed, Bad Janet turns and socks Michael right in the jaw. The blow catches him off guard, and surprisingly hard. He actually sails back a few feet before hitting the ground. Hi, guys! Janet chirps giving the humans a smile that's much too tight. It's me, good Janet, and we need to run right now. With that, she tears off down the streets. No one hesitates to run after her. Eleanor only gets a quick glance back before they round a corner, down a narrow alley and out of sight. Michael's already picking himself up off the ground. His grin is wide as he watches them go. There's a glint in his eye. He's going to chase them. And she knows Michael well. She knows that look. He's going to have fun with it. And that's the end of the first chapter. Yay! Um, <laughs> nice. Yeah, I, again, I really like this fic. I think it's really good. Did you want me to read the next chapter of it? Or do you want me to bump over to a different fic? It's up to you. I am happy either way. If you want me to continue with this one, I'm very happy to. It's not really a problem, so. I like this story a lot. <laughs> okay, changing up is fine. All right. Cool. Just got to find it. <laughs> okay. 
and I'm just gonna quickly run to the washroom because unexpectedly, I went before I started, but unexpectedly, I have to go again. So I'll be right back. Um, oh shoot, I was gonna do something. I forgot. Okay, um, when I was doing the though near or far story, um, I was going to change the image to like a thing that I made for it a while ago. Um, so I just wanted to show it. It's not, in retrospect, I think it's a little bit too hard to read, but when it's smaller on the screen, it looks fine. I don't know. <laughs> it's, uh, it looks, again, it just looks really grainy. I don't know why. Maybe, oh well, it is what it is. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna mi mute, mute my mic and I'll be right back. Uh, do, 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 do. I just got to figure out how to do it. <laughs> and how do I do this? Oh no. There. Oh, okay. Hi, I'm back. <laughs> so yeah, so this is the thingy that I made for the near or far, but um, obviously I just finished that, so I'm gonna switch over to the one that I have for Awakenings, which I'm not as happy with, but that's okay. So there we go. This is the one that I did for Awakenings. I'm not as into it, but uh... <laughs> It's a work in progress, okay? <laughs> um, yeah. Again, it's just really grainy. I don't know. I'm gonna have to figure out. I think it's just because I've saved it at like a much smaller resolution than what I need for doing a stream, so that's okay. <laughs> so yeah, so this one is gonna be Awakenings um, by Lovelace. And one of the reasons that I wanted to read this one was because, um, this is a fanfic that, uh, I think it was published in 2005. Uh, so I would have been 16, 16 when it came out. Yeah, May of 2005. So I was, I was 15 or 16 when I read this. And it just left a really big impact on me, and it made me want to write better. Um, and f it's one of those stories that I always kind of remembered, but because when I read it, it wasn't finished, and also because it was very, like I said, it has a very convoluted sort of way of telling its story. Um, it was one of those fics I always remembered, and it had very vivid imagery, but I couldn't 
for the life of me tell you what it was about. Uh, and then I recently reread it and I was like, oh, I get it now. There's still some things in it that I'm kind of like, I don't quite get, but that's okay. It's still very good. Um, or at least I think it's very good. And, um, yeah, I wanted to share that. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to read the prologue. Like I said, it can be a bit more of a, a, a slog to get into because it's you're getting kind of dropped in the middle of stuff in, in the prologue and in chapter one. So, um, so yeah, uh, it might be, it might be a bit much, but we'll, we'll try it. We'll try it out. Okay. Uh, the fir uh, sorry, I just realized the first thing I'm going to start with is actually they so they start they start the fanfic with a quote, and I can never say this guy's name, so forgive me if I say it wrong. Whoever strives with all his might, that man we can redeem. Goeth fa Faust? Goeth Faust. Faust. <laughs> nice. House. Okay. <laughs> I can never say that name. Okay. Awakenings. Prologue. Look at this world. Look at the broken weight of mountains and the acrid sea that once flashed blue. Look at the jagged teeth of cities the fallen light that once shone with the stars. Look at the bones, tangled limbs of machines and men strewn across the plain. Nothing stirred but the wind and the dead dust and the clouds. Look at these roiling, burning clouds, the sky beyond them none had glimpsed in six hundred years. Lightning crackled and thunder rumbled constantly across the darkness. But from this thunder, there never came rain. In the desert, every drop of rain is miraculous, said the oracle. Then she glanced up at the young woman and smiled, that familiar, enigmatic smile on her face, and said, That's what it's going to take, honey. Bring me a miracle. Back then, Aleph did not understand those words at all. Back then... She was human. Back then, she did not know what a miracle was or could have been, only that the real world was real and code was code, and that there was a difference. It would be a long time before she began to understand. Back then, she never expected the road it would take, through the city of men and the city of machines, through the memory of death and the door of the sun. Most of all, she never expected the man who would walk beside her upon that road, all the way to the end of the world, the maker of her miracle. She never expected that it would be Smith, Smith the program, once an agent, once a virus, always the demon unceasingly rebellious, who tore open the black heavens with flames and light and brought the desert rain. And that's the prologue. It's pronounced Ger Gerda? Gerda? What? Gerda. Gerder? Gerder. It's pr it is pronounced Gerda. Gerda. Fuck, man. Man. How dare. <laughs> How dare. Here, let's I'm gonna I'm gonna listen to a clip really quick. How to pronounce Uh 
Goethe. Goethe. They said that most people say it wrong. Even people who live, th like, who are from Germany say it wrong. How do you pronounce the name? Huh. Okay. <sighs> I'm just going to accept that that's a name I'll never be able to say. I just accept it. I take that on as a truth. And just, just go with it. Oh, you have a link. Thank you, pronouncenames.com. Goethe. 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 I don't know. Goethe. Goethe. Uh, this is hard. <laughs> this is hard and I don't like it. <laughs> Goethe. <laughs> Okay, okay. All right, so chapter one, rain. She was trapped and would not find the door in time. The ground rumbled and smoldered beneath her feet and there was a dry black fire amid the clouds. It had come flashing from the horizon over the distant mountains, slashing across the world like countless gigantic blades, until all the veins of the sky poured out their burning blood and the coiled darkness was dyed with a dull, glowing red. This was not the electrical red of lightning, nor the storm that had for ages raged over all the lands of the earth. This was the end of the world. Savagely, Aleph pushed the thought away. She had to keep moving. She had to find the door. Holding up one arm before her face and squinting hard against the swirling dust, she scrambled over the ruins of the city, a tiny, solitary figure against the mad wind. But in the desert, there was no shelter, and she could no longer see the door. Keep moving. The flames had already fully enveloped the heavens, and trails of inky emptiness reached across the air like tentacles. Keep moving. Because there was a door. Because this was not real. Aleph pulled herself over another heap of bones, struggling to avoid the debris that now roared and flew with the wind. She kept repeating the words to herself, silent, desperate mantras, yet they were beginning to mingle inside her head like the echoes of many voices. This was not real. Desolate and limitless as reality, yet it was only a reflection of reality. A world made of code. She must believe this. Find the door. She must believe there was a door out of here. A door of escape, back to the Matrix, where she would find him. Keep moving. If she believed it was there, then she would see it. The bright blue gleam of hope among the ruins. She had seen it once, and made the passage, a door leading her back to the place of her fall, to make up for what she had done. How much more time did she have? This was only a reflection, only a world made of code, as she herself was made of code. Aleph shoved that thought aside, too. Wildly, she turned her head and scanned the plains as if her own gaze could penetrate right through the edge of sight to another place out of there, to the real world, to the Matrix. If she could but find the door, find her way back, find a way to set things right again, if she could but see out there. 
out there, out there in a world that no longer existed for her. A battle was raging, men against machines, metal against flesh, and death reigned amid the blue arcs of electric blasts, screams, and explosions. Out there was Zion, under attack. The Merovingian had told her as much. The Sentinels have already been deployed. If Zion is destroyed, so will be... So will be all that I have wished, needed to reach. If the material basis of existence is destroyed, so will be the mind and the existence itself. The Frenchman's voice reverberated coldly somewhere in the distance, a white, fluorescent-lit space in the back of her mind. His train station. How much longer do you think the human city has? A day? Six hours? An hour? Ten minutes? How long ago had he said that to her? A day? Six hours? An hour? Ten minutes? Keep moving. Keep looking. Find the door. Find the matrix. Find Smith. Find a way for there. Had. Find a way. For there had to be a way. Hold on. Move on. This place, too, was Zion, a Zion within Zion, a hidden image deep inside the system. Once upon a time, she had worked on the human city's archives, shoring up its defenses, making it impregnable, never suspecting that the desert of the real lay not only above, but within. At a better time, Aleph might have laughed at the irony, but even a virtual world had to be based on hardware, metal, and wires, and processing units, and now she could see it. Their destruction. The air shuddered and writhed all around her, tangled with monstrous tongues of darkness, about to fly apart at a single touch. Was that an EMP blast? Or the lash of a sentinel's steel arms? If she stopped moving... She would simply melt. The earth heaved suddenly, like a convulsed animal, knocking a left to her knees. For a single instant, the shadows and black flames were gone, all gone, and she glimpsed a flash of green illuminating the plain. A sickly, poisonous green, the true shade of all things, flickering code of a collapsing prison going out. There it was, looming just over the horizon. Although she could not quite see it with her eyes, she could sense it. To every direction and within her own codes, deep and certain. Not quite a shadow, much, much darker. A simple and immense emptiness. Non-existence. The jaws were widening, poised to swallow the dead cities and the broken towers and the clouds themselves, and her with them, ready to return everything, dust to dust, ashes to ashes, code to code. The door was gone. It had never been there at all. It was coming closer. She could feel it. Hope faded from her and Aleph turned her eyes away from the horizon. She lifted her face toward the conflagration above. A continuous low noise had begun, a dry, rattling sound, both nowhere and everywhere. There was no light at all now, no break in the darkness. Never was. Never would be. Standing there, amid the wastes, she held herself still, very still now, and closed her eyes. It would be just about now. For a moment she wondered, almost idly, what was happening out there in Zion, the real Zion. Was anyone still alive? What was happening out there in the Matrix? Was anyone still alive? Was he still alive? 
she whispered to no one in particular. Her voice was drowned out immediately by the death rattle of the world. A cold drop of rain fell on her face. The wind abated. The earth shuddered once more as if in aching protest, and for an instant, though she had her eyes closed tightly, Aleph was... Aleph saw light. An infinite white light, not quite in the sky, nor in the distance, but just behind her own eyelids. Nothing but light. Everything had all of a sudden gone very quiet, and the air was utterly still, as if the world had fallen into the center of a deep, deep well. It would never emerge again. So, this was death. Another drop of rain on her skin, then another. Each drop felt like an icy needle that plunged right into her bones. Rain began to fall, at first silently, but then growing stronger, pattering onto the dead land, a steady rhythm against the wild thumping of her own heart. The water was freezingly, impossibly cold, far colder than she had imagined rain could ever be, her heart was still pounding. Slowly, fearful of what she would find, Aleph opened her eyes. At first, she saw nothing. Darkness only. The thought that she had been struck blind flitted across her mind, but just at that moment, there came a growling of thunder somewhere far above, and a crack of lightning flickered among the shadows. By the lightning's fitful glow, Aleph saw that she was standing at exactly the same spot as before, atop a pile of twisted metal and concrete that perhaps once had been the bones of a human dwelling or storefront. Desolation below, clouds above. But the fires that ran among the clouds were different now, merely those of a centuries-old electrical storm. Yes, she was still definitely breathing, and her heart was still beating. The rain was coming down heavily now, splattering and puddling against the debris-ridden streets of the city. Curtains after curtains, spreading out towards the faraway mountains. If she weren't still alive, she wouldn't have felt how cold it was. Something inside her brain reasoned, shakily. It was too dark to ever... It was too dark to see over the horizon, but it was gone, the thing, that inconceivable emptiness. The maw of death that only a short while ago had hovered and approached and stretched out wide, now gone without a trace, as if the codes had never convulsed and torn at all. There was only the desert around her, as it had always been. But in the desert, it never rained. The words floated across her memory, unbidden. Who had said them? Something else was different, too. It took a while for the knowledge to rise into her conscious mind, and then a longer while before she worked up the courage to turn around. She was no longer alone. She knew who it was even before she saw his face. The figure lay motionless on the ground, limbs outstretched against the scattered debris, suit drenched through the ra with rain. His eyes were clenched tightly shut, and there was something close to a grimace on his face. He came with the rain. Cautiously, Aleph approached, then dropped to her knees by Smith's side. His breath came shallow and pained, but he was undoubtedly and solidly there before her eyes, nothing like a mirage or hallucination at all. She stared down at him for several endless heartbeats, not even daring to blink. Then, for some reason unknown to herself, glanced up quickly at the sky. Shadows only, of course. The noise of the downpour grew louder and louder until it was all but unbearable until it was all but intolerable. A toneless uniform drumming inside her head. She looked up, 
stumps and corpses of buildings crouched behind the night. Patches of deeper blackness against the blackness of the air. Nothing stirred. Only a moment later did she realize that she must have been looking for a hiding place. A place where she could get away from him. But she could neither think nor move. An invisible line held her fast to the still form on the ground, right in front of her, so near. I am no longer an agent. The icy sound of falling water resolved into a voice in her memory, one that was not nearly as cold or supercilious as she, is, as she had expected. I need to talk to you, Aleph. With careful movements, ready to pull back and start running any instant, Aleph reached over and checked under the right side of Smith's jacket. His gun was gone. Her trembling fingertips brushed against the shirt plastered to his body, although she tried to avoid making contact. It scalded her hand. Programs could not be feverish. The small part of her mind that was still human piped up idiotically. There was something wrong with him. You knew that. It went on. You knew that six months ago. Too late to change things now. Get away from him. Flee. What had he done? What had she done herself? He is no longer an agent and there is nothing to hold back his madness. The Merovingian's familiar voice reverberated off the brightly lit walls of the subway station. He is close to destroying us all. Closer with every passing second. Smith twitched suddenly and Aleph almost jumped. He was dreaming. A nightmare. What had happened to him these last six months? She shook her head, struggling to gather herself. The world had stopped making sense for too long ago for human, for human rationality. For the last six months she had consumed... For the last six months... She had consumed her mind trying and failing to imagine this very moment. Yet now, she had not needed escaping the prison to find him, after all. What she, what she had done six months ago, when he had stood there back in the Matrix facing her. He had looked at her with that awful look in his eyes, mad with anger and desperate, and yet yet so near to pleading. What had she said to him then? I made a terrible mistake. This time, the silent voice that answered was her own. She leaned forward, hypnotized, her fingers hovering an inch from Smith's face, almost touching. There was a small cut along the edge of his jaw, still red, How much time had passed? The rain had stopped, and the wind was blowing again. Lightly, Aleph reached down and touched his face, only the fingertips making contact, barely brushing the side of one cheek. A pair of inhumanly blue eyes flew open. And that's the first chapter. And thank you. I'm glad to know that I have a moving voice. I, I worry sometimes. I don't know if a narrator is supposed to sound very emotionally invested or if they're supposed to sound sort of distant. And I'm never quite sure. I think it sounds good when I'm emotionally invested, but I don't know. <laughs> and yeah, Murph 100% has a point. He He's going bazonkers. <laughs> yeah, like, I feel like this is... It's interesting to me because when I look at this and I I look at it objectively, I'm like, there's a lot of the narrator asking herself questions um, and there's a lot of voices being called up that are all memories, you know, things like that. And those are things that I might normally associate with writing that was just, you know, I think of it as being very fanfic -y kind of writing, but it's very good writing. I, I think that the writing in this is very nice and... Um, 
they're able to paint a very vivid picture. Um, but I, I was I was nervous that uh, that it would come off as a bit f f uh, <laughs> uh, ficky or whatever. But yeah, it's very good. It's very good. Um, yeah, this person should be writing novels. Probably are. I agree. They're, they're very good. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised. There's a lot of people who start out writing fanfic. I mean, you know this. There's a lot of people who start out writing fanfic that do end up becoming, uh, you know, authors in, in the more traditional sense of publishing novels and stuff. Um, there's a lady I follow on Tumblr. I can't think of her name, but she has a series called the vanishing series i think and um she she started out writing x-files fanfic and that's where she developed her writing skills and um i just find that really cool really interesting and again it's proof that fanfic has merit and value um but even if even if you didn't end up becoming a published person of uh, from your practice with writing fanfic it's still a valuable thing like uh i think a lot of people focus too much on product i mean you know this i think people put too much um too much value on productivity instead of saying like well i made a thing because i wanted to and it brought me joy <laughs> it brought me joy to make this thing um and it contributed to something nice i think that that's more valuable but you know, you know. <laughs> but yeah, so that's what I have. Um, I could read another chapter of this. I could go read a chapter of something else. It's 4.30. Let me just see how long this stream's been going on. Um, I'm going for about an hour. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to go. I'm going to start dinner. And uh, I'll probably do... I'll probably do another thing tomorrow. And I'll probably just read chapter two of both fix. Oh, no, you don't You don't have to... Don't worry about it. Um, an hour is pretty long. Like, I normally I go like an hour or two hours. So it's not a big deal. I got done kind of what I wanted to get done today. So it's all good. <laughs> all right. And uh, I was trying... I was trying with this, I kind of tried to change up how I read some stuff. I read things a little differently than I normally would. Um, so let me know if you think it's kind of a hit or miss. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I will let you go. And thank you for coming and watching and listening to me go on. It's always really appreciated. All right, you take care and uh, say hi to your parents for me. <laughs> Bye.